protection program. He testified against Harry Alleman, so did the accomplice. Harry was convicted, and today he's spending the rest of his life behind bars. That is the power of corroborating evidence in a court of law. The question is, do we have any corroboration for the New Testament of the Bible? Do we have any evidence outside the Bible that corroborates what the New Testament tells us about Jesus? Following the pattern of my investigation, my next step was to determine whether or not there was any evidence outside the New Testament that corroborates what the New Testament tells us. Jesus, of course, wasn't the emperor of the Roman Empire. He wasn't some autocrat that had conquered half of the world, but he did leave an impact in his own environment and created a movement that grew from there. And there is a remarkable amount of documents and corroboration. Josephus refers to him. The Roman historian Tacitus uh, refers to him, Suetonius, the political writer, refers to him. Uh, critics refer to him. And so uh, it's like a stone thrown into a pond. The ripples go out and out and everywhere are felt. It's a very impressive record taken as a whole. In AD 93, the Jewish historian Josephus published his work Antiquities of the Jews. Scholars generally agree that the following text accurately records Josephus' record of Jesus. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. When Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him first did not forsake him. And the tribe of Christians, so named for him, are not extinct to this day. In a court of law, the rebuttal case is an opportunity for the other side to present their evidence. When recent years, there's been a proliferation of books and articles about the so-called Gnostic Gospels. And I wanted to figure out, does this represent the mainstream of academic scholarship? The Gnostic Gospels are a collection of religious writings from the second and third centuries. They blend the teachings of Jesus with a variety of ancient philosophical beliefs. According to the tenets of Gnosticism, the universe was the creation of a flawed and wicked God. Therefore, all matter was evil. Salvation from this world could only be attained through secret knowledge about the spiritual nature of man. There's been a lot of talk about the Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Thomas. These documents are almost universally recognized to be much later than the New Testament Gospels and not to record uh, historically reliable material related to Jesus. Well, the New Testament Gospels give us a portrait of a early first century Palestinian Jesus of Nazareth. The Gospels from the second century, which are mostly Gnostic Gospels, such as the Gospel of Judas or the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Philip or the Gospel of Mary, they give us a very different Jesus. Now, you can pick and choose if you want. You can say, well, I like the second century Gnostic Jesus better. Others might want the early first century Palestinian Jesus. But if you're going to be a scholar about it, and you're going to talk about, well, which Gospels really do give us earlier traditions that more reliably reflect the actual historical Jesus, you got to go with the New Testament Gospels every time. There's a view among some that there were all of these different competing views of Jesus Christ and that the one that won out became the orthodox perspective of Christ um, reflected in the Gospels. 
Um, all the evidence runs contrary to that. Jesus was a first century Jewish teacher um, who revealed and demonstrated himself to be the Messiah. Uh, that's the presentation we get in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the New Testament Gospels. Uh, these later Gospels, these Gnostic Gospels, um, present a very different Jesus, almost a Greek philosopher, an esoteric Gnostic Jesus. It's clearly not the authentic historical Jesus. What I've come to discover is that the Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are our best sources for Jesus. And I've also found that they are reliable and that from these sources we can form a picture that I believe is very accurate, that tells us about Jesus, what he taught, how he was perceived by his contemporaries, and what his life was really all about. Everything from Jesus' parables, to his healings, to his controversies, to his warnings, and all of that, the reason they were telling this stuff is that not just it was good advice for them in their own day, but that it actually mattered that it actually happened. And if it hadn't happened, you're into a totally different worldview, a worldview which is about ideas, which is about self-realization, hugely popular in our culture just now, discovering who I really am. You know, for goodness sake, Jesus didn't come to help me discover who I really am. He came to tell me who he knew I really was and to do something about it. And that's much better news. I remember one time a witness was called in a murder trial I was covering for the Chicago Tribune. He was supposed to testify that he had seen the defendant shoot the victim. But instead, he shocked everybody by saying, I shot him. Later, the defendant got in the stand and said, yeah, that's right. He shot him, not me. Suddenly, the jury had two conflicting stories. Prosecutors had strong evidence that the defendant was guilty. But now there was another version of events that flatly contradicted that. In the end, though, several other eyewitnesses confirmed that the defendant was guilty and that the witness who confessed was merely trying to cover for him. With overwhelming evidence of his guilt, the defendant was convicted. In a similar way, we have the New Testament painting one picture of Jesus, but the so-called alternative gospels telling another story, which is right. Well, the evidence strongly supports the New Testament. Unlike the Gnostic Gospels, they're based on eyewitness testimony, they're written very close to the events they describe, and they're confirmed at points by archeology span and secular history. Consequently, I believe that we can have confidence that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John contain the most reliable information about Jesus. Well, how about you? Where would you say the arrow of evidence at this juncture points? Toward or away from the Gospels being relied on? It was one of Chicago's most infamous murders. Eight student nurses were slain in an apartment complex more than 40 years ago. The murderer fled the scene, threw his weapons into the river, and sought treatment at a hospital for some injuries. He thought he could get away with the murders because no one had seen him commit the crime. But his plan unraveled when it was revealed that a ninth nurse had hidden under a bed witnessed the killings and was able to give police a description of the killer. Police distributed a sketch based on her account and an emergency room physician who was treating Richard Speck was able to identify him as the slayer. Ever since Scotland Yard first disseminated the drawing of a murder suspect in 1889, sketch artists have been taking the recollections of witnesses and creating a likeness of the suspect. 
most sketch artists today have been replaced by technology, as many police officers are trained on computer systems to create photo-like images of criminals. In a way, the Old Testament contains a descriptive sketch of the likeness of God, based on his attributes and characteristics. Now, Jesus claims to be divine, but how well does his likeness fit this sketch in the Old Testament? That's what we're going to explore in this fascinating session today. In addition to the claims that Jesus makes about himself in the New Testament, there are also reports that he performed the miraculous, that he walked on water and healed the sick and turned water into wine and, and raised the dead and did exorcisms. And so I had to know, uh, is there evidence that these miracles are a result of his divine nature? Jesus' contemporaries, that is people who liked him, people who were indifferent, neutral, and people who opposed him all acknowledged he did extraordinary things. Now, of course, the people who liked Jesus and believed in him and followed him said Jesus did these powerful works because of the Spirit of God. People who opposed him would say, well, I admit he does these amazing things, but it's because the devil is helping him. The Talmud actually speaks of some of these things. In some of the passages that deal with Yeshua, it has him as a, well, a magician. And why do they describe him as a magician? It's, it, it's not flattering. There's a historical recognition here that when Yeshua came, he did miracles, just as Isaiah 35 indicates in the Messianic age, when the Messiah comes, he'll be able to make the blind see and the lame walk. The New Testament Gospels record at least 40 separate miracles performed by Jesus during the course of his ministry. They include healings, exorcisms, mastery over nature, and even raising of the dead. Christian theology has always held that these miracles are part of a total picture that displays the attributes of God himself, unlimited power, total knowledge, ever-present, unchanging, eternal. There's no question that the biographies of Jesus describe him as a worker of mighty deeds. But I wanted to know, does this make him any different than the other miracle workers and magicians of the ancient world? Miracle workers that we find occasionally in the first century uh, are magicians. They use incantations, they use spells, they, they try to coerce um, gods or divine figures to work on their behalf. That's very different than Jesus' miracles. Jesus' his miracles were to demonstrate the power of the kingdom of God. When he healed the sick, he pointed back to Isaiah's prophecies that when God's kingdom would come, when God's salvation would come, the lame would walk, the blind would see. This was the demonstration that God's kingdom was arriving. He's an exorcist. You don't find any of those in the Old Testament. People were not looking for messianic exorcists. He carves out his own niche. He reveals his identity in his own way. It becomes clear that he is somebody who can take on the powers of darkness himself and win. What kind of person is that? And he doesn't have to use recipes and formulas like other ancient exorcists. He can just call the demon by name and that boy's out of there. One of the most astonishing things that Jesus did was when he claimed to forgive sins. In Mark's Gospel, chapter two, a man is brought to him paralyzed man, and the crowds around him are expecting Jesus to heal him. But instead, the first thing Jesus said is, your sins are forgiven. Only God forgives sins. Now, some might say, well, Jesus may have been forgiving sins on behalf of God. But in fact, that's not the way his listeners understood him, because immediately the religious leaders responded to that. Who is this that forgives sins? Only God forgives sins, they claim. But Jesus claims the ability to forgive sins. And then to confirm that he has that authority, he then heals the man. 
And so a very obvious question arises. That is, is Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one sent by God to be the savior of Israel and the world? Christians told me that there are dozens and dozens of ancient prophecies contained in the Old Testament of the Bible, and that they predict the coming of this Messiah, and that Jesus, against all mathematical odds, fulfill those prophecies. And I thought, you know, this is a little bit like the fingerprint evidence you see in a court of law. I remember covering one particular case where the murderer went through the purse of the victim, and he left one thumbprint on the cellophane wrapper of a package of cigarettes. And it was that thumbprint that led to his conviction for murder. And I thought, in an analogous way, could it be that these ancient prophecies are sort of like that thumbprint on the cellophane? Do they create a thumbprint that only Jesus Christ in all of history manages to match? This is Yashiyahu 53.6 or Isaiah 53.6. Kulanu katson ta'inu, ishla darko paninu, badonai hifnia bo, eight avon kulanu. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. I had a friend who wrote this out on a piece of paper. He typed it up on his computer without any verse notations. And he took it around to everyone uh, in his office. He worked in a big office for a motor vehicle bureau in one of the big states in our country. And he showed it to everyone in the motor vehicle bureau and uh, in the state capitol. And he said, just tell me who this is and where it comes from. And every single person that looked at it, Jew or Gentile alike, it didn't matter. Everyone that looked at it read it and he said, who is this? They said, oh, it's obviously Jesus of Nazareth. That's who it is. And it's from the New Testament. And then my friend would say, but no, it's not from the New Testament. It's from the Hebrew Bible. It was written eight centuries before Jesus came. Can you believe this? And he showed it to them from Isaiah. And people really had a hard time, because if you read this passage without any kind of presuppositions or bias, you will read it, and it will be really clear that this is the life of, of Yeshua. Now, could he have fabricated this, or is this just a big coincidence? In the Old Testament, we really have two kinds of prophecies. We have prophecies that are fulfilled uniquely in Christ and prophecies that are fulfilled typologically in Christ. And I do think we need to distinguish between the two. Uh, those that are fulfilled uniquely in Christ were, were once and for all fulfilled by Jesus. And those are the ones that we can really point to to have apologetic value. That is to demonstrate that, that Jesus was the only person who could have possibly fulfilled this. His birth in Bethlehem is one of those prophecies. His role as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is one of those prophecies. His entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey from Zechariah chapter 9. These are clear evidence that Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament. The most amazing part of Isaiah's prophecies is in Isaiah 9 when it speaks about the son of David coming to be the king, to sit on the throne of David and have an eternal righteous kingdom. And everyone knows it from Handel's Messiah. Unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. And the idea of this verse is that the Messiah will actually be born, physically born. And then it says, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity. In other words, he's the creator, the author of time. Some skeptics have said that Jesus could have engineered the fulfillment of these prophecies. Of course, Jesus could not have determined where he was going to be born. So to be born in Bethlehem, obviously, he could not have engineered that. Also, as the suffering servant, it would have been difficult for him to engineer such a specific fulfillment of Isaiah 53. But on the other hand, the fact that Jesus performed certain actions that, in fact, fulfilled prophecies only demonstrates that he was indeed the Messiah. Um, anyone who enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey, an obvious fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, is saying, yes, I am the Messiah. So we certainly have a glimpse in that fulfilled prophecy of the self-consciousness of Jesus, that he truly believed that he was the Messiah. Scholars have determined that Jesus fulfilled at least four dozen major prophecies, each written a minimum of three centuries before his birth. Their content ranged from specific details about his life to the symbolic implications of his death. Psalm 22 gives a poetic picture by David, written in the first person, of what the Messiah will be like in his suffering. 
And one of the things he says is that they will pierce my hands and my feet. Now, David wrote before crucifixion was known, probably by about 300 years. So Isaiah 53 says he was pierced through. It gives us the reason for his death. He was pierced through for our iniquities. So there's a purpose. He dies not just because he's a martyr, but because he's a substitution for sin. A college professor of mathematics and science named Dr. Peter Stoner wanted to determine what the odds were that any human being throughout history could fulfill the messianic prophecies. So he had his students come up with very conservative estimates of the likelihood of any human being fulfilling certain of these predictions. And then they just ran the numbers. And what they determined is that the odds of any human being fulfilling 48 of these ancient prophecies would be one chance in a trillion, 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 trillion. It is mathematically virtually impossible. To me, just as significant as all of those unique prophecies that were fulfilled in Christ is the complete drama of the Old Testament, the fact that the Old Testament is the story, the narrative of God's redemptive movement, his movement to deliver and save humanity. And Jesus is the climax of that movement. He is the climax of salvation history, the one who brings it off to fulfillment. You read the Old Testament, it's building, building, building. Uh, Jesus arrives on the scene and he is the fulfillment. And he, he recognizes himself clearly as the climax of God's plan of salvation for all humanity. This whole case was sort of like one of those jigsaw puzzles where you don't know what the ultimate picture is gonna be. You just put together the pieces and it, as I was putting together all of the evidence, it started to take shape and, and I sort of stepped back and I could see that it was a portrait of Jesus Christ. Clarence Hiller spent the day painting the white trim on the outside of his house on West 104th Street in Chicago. Later that night, he was killed inside his house by an intruder. The Chicago police arrested a suspect, but they needed more evidence. As they searched the crime scene, they determined that the killer had entered Hiller's house through a rear kitchen window. Upon closer examination, they found what they needed. Outside, forever imprinted on the white paint that Hiller himself had applied just hours before his death, detectives found four perfectly preserved fingerprints that led to the suspect's conviction. The year was 1910, and this marked the first time that fingerprint evidence had ever been used to convict someone of murder in the United States. In an analogous way, the dozens of prophecies contained in the Old Testament of the Bible foretelling the coming of the Messiah, form a kind of fingerprint that only the Messiah could fit. And Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ alone, against all mathematical odds, is the only one in history who matched this prophetic fingerprint. To me, this is powerful and persuasive evidence that he is the predicted Messiah of Israel and the world. How about you? At this point in your journey, where would you say the evidence points, toward or away from Jesus being the Messiah? No eyewitnesses saw Timothy McVeigh load two tons of fertilizer-based explosives into a rental truck, drive to Oklahoma City, and detonate the bomb at the federal courthouse, killing 168 people. And yet a jury was able to conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that he had committed the worst act of domestic terrorism in United States history. Why? Because of circumstantial evidence. Things like a motel bill, a taxi receipt, a bill from a Chinese restaurant, and a truck key.
These were among 700 exhibits that wove a web of evidence from which Timothy McVeigh was unable to extricate himself. Circumstantial evidence consists of indirect facts from which reasonable inferences can be drawn. Sometimes a circumstantial case can be even more powerful than eyewitness testimony. Look at the case of Timothy McVeigh. He was sent to the death chamber based on circumstantial proof. But what about the case for Christ? We've already seen that we have evidence for the empty tomb, for eyewitnesses, and for accounts that are so early that they cannot be legendary. But do we have other facts? Do we have circumstantial evidence for the resurrection? So we have the empty tomb, we have the eyewitnesses, we have the early accounts. The question is, are there any other additional facts, circumstantial evidence, to support the resurrection? While the Apostle Paul described hundreds of eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus, the full impact of the event is perhaps best measured by the subsequent growth of the early Christian church in the face of intense persecution. Even the most critical, skeptical scholars recognized that the earliest disciples at least believed that God had raised Jesus from the dead. In fact, they pinned nearly everything on it. Without belief in Jesus' resurrection, the early Christian movement could never have come into being. They recognized in Jesus something special, but they, they wondered if they were mistaken when he, when he died. They didn't anticipate that. Suffer, maybe, but die at the hands of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor? In fact, even when the first reports of his resurrection reached their ears, they, they were still doubtful and skeptical. But when they met the risen Lord, their skepticism was transformed into a very confident faith, a great joy, and a determination to preach the good news to everyone else. And I think that's the part that's awfully hard to refute because we have this turnabout, this transformation of a discouraged and bewildered following on the basis of the good news. Somehow you have to explain the explosion from scared followers who run away to let's worship him, let's sing to him, let's pray to him. If there was no resurrection, and more to the point, if there was no resurrection appearances of Jesus, to those who doubted and were discouraged and denied and betrayed Jesus, we would not be sitting here talking about this today. Other messianic figures had risen in the past, had claimed to be somebody, um, and had been suppressed and killed by the Romans. Um, yet no movement arose around those dead messiahs. But these disciples of Jesus um, were willing to go to the ends of the earth proclaiming the gospel message, were willing to suffer and die for that. The transformation from a bunch of defeated cowards to boldly, fearlessly proclaiming the gospel, even to the point of death, to me confirms that something happened on that first Easter morning. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. 2 Corinthians 11, 23. After Jesus' crucifixion, the disciples lived lives of hardship for 20, 30, 40 years, suffered greatly in their ministries, and eventually suffered martyrdom and execution without recanting for their belief that they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. I mean, what were they gaining? Were they becoming rich? They're running around the countryside. They're in some cases abandoning their family for periods of time so they can preach. What they got for their efforts is death in many cases. You also have to remember that the disciples died not just for something they believed was true. They died for something they actually saw with their own eyes. It's much more difficult to explain that away 
than it is for someone who dies for a belief and they're sincerely wrong. I came across a bit of evidence I really found fascinating. James was a half-brother of Jesus, and he was not a believer in Jesus during Jesus' lifetime. But he later died the death of a martyr as a leader of the local church. In a similar way, Saul of Tarsus was a persecutor of Christians, and yet he later becomes the Apostle Paul, this incredible missionary. So I had to ask myself, what led to this radical transformation of these skeptics? Sometimes people will come to believe something they wish to be true. If you believe hard enough that a person is loving and kind, you can talk yourself into believing that even though the person is not loving and kind. It's very, very difficult, however, to explain people coming to believe something that they're actually standing against. Now, in the case of James and Paul, they did not believe in Jesus before his crucifixion. In fact, they thought he was deranged, and they did not accept what he said and what he taught. James, the brother of Jesus, is a skeptic who doesn't come to Jesus until he meets the risen Lord. Critics allow that. Paul's a persecutor until he meets the risen Jesus. That's not the kind of testimony of someone who all gets together and say, hey, let's just uh, cook this thing up. One of the certainties, it seems to me, related to the testimony of the apostles is that they truly believed uh, that Jesus was who he claimed he was, and they truly believed that he had risen from the dead. Um, because they were willing to die for that. Very few people are willing to die uh, for something they don't really believe in or something even worse that they know to be a lie. When Jesus was executed, his disciples were rightly afraid. They scattered. They were fearful for their own life. Their hopes had been dashed because they had believed Jesus was the promised one who was going to usher a new day in for Israel. Turned out he wasn't because he was murdered by crucifixion under the authority of the Roman Empire. And yet, shortly thereafter, we find them taking a stand in Jerusalem, proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah, the very Son of God. How do we explain that? How do we explain the fact that they were even willing to propagate this the rest of their lives and go to martyrs' deaths for their belief? The only rational explanation is that something happened to them between the death of Jesus and three days later. And according to their own words, it was that they saw Jesus risen from the dead for themselves. The evidence accumulated over time until November the 8th of 1981, which is sort of when I reached a critical mass. I remember going alone in my room and I took a yellow legal pad and put a line down the middle. And on one side, I started to list all of the evidence I had encountered for Jesus Christ being the Son of God. And on the other side, all the negative evidence against that. And I, I wrote and I wrote page after page. And finally, I put my pen down. And I said, wait a minute. In light of this avalanche of evidence pointing toward the truth of Christianity, it would require more faith for me to maintain my atheism than to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And so that's the moment that I decided, consistent with the evidence, the most logical, the most rational step I could take was a step of faith in the same direction the evidence was pointing and put my trust in Jesus. And uh, after I did that, I thought, you know, maybe Leslie would like to hear about this. I thought it was too good to be true. My heart was pounding. I was in tears. I was so excited. I just threw my arms around him and kissed him and hugged him and told him how I'd been praying and how lots of people had been praying that this day would come. She threw her arms around me and she said, you hard-hearted son of a Baptist. She said, she said, I've been telling you this for two years. I mean, come on. And that began a transformational process for me, where over time, my philosophy and my attitudes, relationships, parenting, uh, worldview, all of that began to change over time for good, really for good. When Lee became a Christian, his whole life started to change to the extent that our five-year-old daughter 
who also saw those, those changes, went to her Sunday school teacher and told her that she wanted Jesus to do in her life what he had done in her daddy's life. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And you know, that's my story. It was someone who said, I'm gonna investigate this stuff with an open mind, let it take me wherever the evidence will take me. And what I discovered in the end is Jesus made the claim that he is the truth, that everything hinges on his identity. In fact, everything hinges on the resurrection because anybody can claim to be the Son of God. If Jesus really did return from the dead, then he is who he claimed to be, and that changes everything. But what about your own journey? I'd really encourage you, if you've never done it, to investigate the evidence for yourself, but make three resolutions up front. Number one, make it a front burner issue in your life. Number two, resolve to have an open mind, to go wherever the evidence takes you, even if it takes you to the very uncomfortable conclusion that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And then finally, resolve that once the evidence is in, you will reach a verdict in the case for Christ. Of all the lawyers who've ever argued a case before a jury, no one has been more successful than Sir Lionel Lucku. As a defense attorney, he won 248 murder trials in a row, either before a jury or on appeal. No wonder the Guinness Book of World Records called him the most successful lawyer in the world. When I was a student at Yale Law School, I would read about Sir Lionel, and I would think, man, he must really be smart. He must really be savvy. He must be able to take what looks like an airtight case against his client and find all of the loopholes in it. More than anybody, he must know what constitutes reliable and persuasive evidence. And all that was true of Sir Lionel, who was knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth and who served as a member of the highest court of his land. And the other reason I admired this guy, because he was an atheist like I was. Until one day, someone said, well, Sir Lionel, you're, you're the greatest lawyer in the world. Have you ever taken your monumental legal knowledge and applied it to the historical record for the resurrection of Jesus and come to an informed decision about whether it really occurred? And he said, no, I haven't done that, but I will. And so Sir Lionel spent years of his life doing exactly that. And I will recite to you one sentence that he wrote that summarized his conclusion. He said, I say, unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. This from the greatest lawyer who ever lived. And based on the evidence, Sir Lionel found the verdict for Jesus Christ. And he said, as a result, my life changed 180 degrees for the good. Well, now you're sitting in the jury box. It's time for you to weigh the evidence in the case for Christ. He offers forgiveness and grace and eternal life as a free gift, but it's one you can accept or you can reject. Your decision, your verdict. But just know this, I am going to be cheering you on as you personally weigh the evidence in the case for Christ.
so there is a whole lot of evidence uh, pointing toward uh, Christ and his resurrection and uh, and in that the reliability of scripture uh, we can have uh, hope and we can trust what uh, the Bible says and I just wanted to read uh, read one verse and then uh, then we can go home uh, actually I take that back we're going to read a, a few verses but in one scripture, First uh, Peter chapter one, we've we've read these verses before as we've been looking at why do we believe that the Bible is reliable? Uh, verse twenty three: Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Uh, we can trust, based upon all of the uh, all the evidence, we can trust that the Bible is reliable. And uh, without evidence, uh, we still can trust uh, the evidence. I, I believe uh, is is overwhelming, uh, but but we have to have faith. And uh, faith is is the substance. It is the evidence of things not seen. And uh, all of those evidences that, that he was pointing at uh, is great, but the best evidence that I can tell you is this book has changed my life. And uh, if you have been saved, it has changed your life as well. Uh, 2,000, at 2000 years after the last, uh, last sentence was, uh, was written down, uh, this book still is alive today. And uh, we, can, uh, we can count on it, we can trust it, we can believe it. And uh, so I hope uh, I hope you believe it. Any questions or comments? Yep, and there's there's several people who uh, have have tried to to read through the Bible and find uh, its errors and its inconsistencies, uh, and then they end up believing in Jesus, and uh, that's that's what the Word does. Uh, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And uh, so, if, if people would uh, just just sit down and and read it, and and as he said at the end, with an open mind. Uh, Thinking maybe I am wrong about what I believe. Maybe I am wrong for being an atheist or an agnostic. And uh, by the end, the evidence is clear. Jesus is real. Uh, the God's word is is fact, and, uh, and we can trust it. All right. Thank y'all for being here tonight. Let's stand up, and uh, we'll be dismissed in prayer. Uh, don't forget uh, Wednesday evening youth group at six thirty, and. Uh, and then don't forget your baby bottles next Sunday, Father's Day. All right, we'll be dismissed in prayer. And I'm going to ask Richard, if you would, to dismiss us today.